shall we start, Patrick? Or okay, so so let's um, let's resume where we where we um, where we left off last night. So I, we we were looking at some path. We were looking at some some data, and we noticed two patterns. So for those who weren't here, we have some phenotypic resemblance here for five different traits and for seven different pairings of relatives who differ both in their genetic relatedness and in their um, in the extent to which they shared their uh, rearing environments. Um, and we noticed some patterns. So the first was that uh, uh, among siblings reared in the same home, greater genetic similarity is associated with greater phenotypic similarity. And that's the kind of thing that you can't explain without some sort of um, uh, genetic factors at play in the model, at least not easily. And we noticed that among siblings um, reared apart, um, um, compared to siblings reared together, we, holding fixed genetic relatedness, we see that the, the, um, uh, there is greater resemblance for the sibtypes that were reared together, holding constant uh, genetic relatedness. So this is the full sibs, this is the half sibs. Okay? And, and these sorts of comparisons are the, are the idea underlying a lot of uh, behavior, a lot of these you know, modifications of Fisher's scheme that try to, that try to um, 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 relax this potentially problematic assumption that you know, uh, any resemblance between two kinships by assumption, unless you're dealing with spouses, cannot be, uh, is, is, is due to something uh, genetic. So now I want to walk through some... Uh, some um, experiments that one might uh, your thought experiments um, and the hope is to sort of clarify some of the assumptions that we're implicitly making when we when we study things like twins um, real apart so so let's start with monozygotic twins they're very um, they're a very commonly uh, studied population um, and so let's imagine that we could take a large representative sample of twins and randomly assign them um, to environments at birth. Okay, and I see there's a comment in chat, so let me know if there are questions. Um, so immediately, there's one issue that comes up here. If the, if the purpose is to do an experimental comparison, so what's the, what's what's that issue? So remember, we, we're, our um, our goal here, right, is to generalize in some sense the population as a whole to say something about these variance components in the population, and the twins are kind of a trick for getting there. Um, and so I started at birth here in this comparison. So what did I sort of omit <laughs> by doing that? What's an, what's an issue that I'm kind of sweeping under the rug a little bit? Anybody? Well, it has something to do with pre-birth environment. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So you, could, you could imagine, you know, you could imagine, you know, you, you know, in the ideal experiment, how would you want to, how would you want to think about the prenatal environment? Um, okay. No, that's okay. I understand. We have some Zoom guests. Um, so, so you, know, you, you, you can imagine that twins aren't perfectly representative of the population as a whole in all kinds of ways. I mean, in some ways, it's obvious. They weigh less, less at birth on average. They shared the, the womb with another um, co-twin. Um, so you can imagine that has you know, effects that sort of complicate this um, comparisons. For many purposes, that might not, just, that might not be a first-order thing, but it's something to be aware of. It's something to really, you should be aware of the fact that you're making some implicit assumption there about representativeness, okay? Um, and then I said we randomly assign them to environments, okay? So ignoring this pre-birth issue, you know, the random assignment means that, um, um, that there's not, not going to be any, any gene environment covariance, right, by uh, the... the, the, the um, the genotype of, a, of each twin is not going to be associated with the environment that we assign them to. Um, and, um, um, and there's not going to be a genetic covariance because we assign them to different um, households. Another issue that immediately should come up, that you should start thinking about, is the fact that, you know, in practice, right, these adoption experiments don't take place like this. You know, we don't, we don't grab the babies the first day that they're born, and we don't, don't, then don't, don't flip a coin and pick an environment for them to go to, right? So, so these separation experiments that people try to leverage, they're kind of uh, intended to be you know, the best approximation we have for something like this. Yeah. But if these assumptions hold, we end up with a, with a moment condition like this. And of course, in practice, they don't hold. So we end up hoping that something like this is approximately valid. Right? Um, and I've actually written, I, 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 we're going we're gonna to 
uh, we're going to um, abstract from this little complication in a moment. But I've written this as the covariance, um, so the covariance of the uh, of the of the of these twins in this uh, hypothetical experiment is going to be equal to g squared for the variance of this g factor, right, of this genetic factor. Um, but notice it's a covariance on the left hand side and not a correlation. So can anybody can anybody tell me why I did it that way? Why 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 can't we just make this a correlation? I mean, if the if, if in the population we standard we normalize the standard deviation to one, why can't we just say this is a correlation? Why why is that, am, am I just being Am I just complicating things needlessly here? Anybody, can anybody notice what that, see, think about the, I don't know why I might have done it that way. So in the population, right, in the population we, 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 uh, we said, you know, we, there might be some gene environment covariance, yeah? Under, this, under, this, under the um, conditions of this thought experiment, are we going to see any gene environment covariance? There's no gene environment covariance, right, because we randomly assigned Twins to environments, so the, the two you might have that the two are correlated in the population, but not in, under this thought experiment. What that means is that the variance in the population, which is expected to be higher than the variance in this um, in this sample, even if twi if these MC twins are perfectly representative with respect to their distribution of G's and with respect to their distribution of U's. Does that make sense? And then I said something that's sort of true but I made an additional implicit assumption. I said the variance is going to be higher in the population than in, this, uh, than in this representative sample of twins. And in doing so, I made an assumption about the sign of the gene environment covariance. What did I assume about it? Did I assume it was positive or negative? Positive, yeah? Yeah. Um, so what that means is that in order to, um, in effect, what you have to do if you don't work through the math, you have to, you have to uh, multiply this by a ratio of uh, variances. Okay? You have to multiply by the ratio of the variance in the population to the variance in the, um, in the, um, uh, in the sample of monozygotic twins. So that's just a standardization, uh, but I'll keep it in mind and we'll drop it eventually. So then, you know, we can, we can go out, we can estimate this covariance, and uh, it's going to give us uh, something like a consistent estimate of VG in principle. That, you know, we could, we could do something like that. And, and so what we get then is, a, is, a, is an estimate of the variance of these genetic factors. And once we have that, we're all, we almost have some, we're almost ready to, you know, we almost have something that's an estimate of broad heritability, except that there's a standardization phase. We have to multiply by you know, a ratio of variances. Um, okay, so that's experiment number one. Let, let's let's, let's think, th think through a, a couple more. Okay, but clearly MD twins seem very useful uh, read a part seem very useful if you want to learn something about a broad heritability. So what are some other things that, you know, so let, let's just make sure we're on the same page. What, give me a list of things that go wrong in practice or that aren't perfect in practice when we try to do something like this um, in, the, um, um, in the real world. Yeah? It's not completely random, yeah? So it might be that, you know, that the G, your G ends up being correlated with the environment that you're assigned to, you know, because they know something about your family background that's correlated with your G and that, you know. So that's one factor. Um, there's another factor about, you know, so, so good, good. What else? Yeah, it's not going to happen at birth, so there's going to be some shared, certainly, you know, pre-birth environments are going to be shared to some extent that could have some, you know, relevance. Uh, what else? Yeah. Mothers of twins are not random samples. Mothers of twins are not random samples. Um, they're older, and that's increasingly the case, right? Because especially, well, maybe not with MZ twins. I don't know about that. But with DZ twins, it's more and more common that you know associate with IVF, right? Right. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely, it might not happen right away. And then the last thing, maybe the most important, is that in practice, you don't, you know, even on the, even, you know. Not everybody's allowed to adopt a child, which is in practice what we're talking about, right? So, so you could imagine um, that um, you can imagine that there's a kind of restricted range of environments to which these twins would actually be assigned. I mean, that's especially a problem in, in adoption studies, um, uh, from the point of view of you know, doing from the point of view of the adoption researcher. Okay, so um, okay, so now let's let's repeat the experiment, but now for full or half sibs um, uh, reared apart. So 
due to random assignment, we again have that, you know, by assumption, so the thought experiment is the same, but now we do it for half sibs and, and, and full sibs. Again, the, the environments are uncorrelated by assumption. Um, pinning down these genetic covariances is harder without a bunch of assumptions. But, you know, um, I I if, we, um, if we use this um, a Kempthorne model and, and assume that there's no epistasis, we get something like this for the full twin. So half of the additive genetic variance is going to be shared, a quarter of the dominance variance. And so again, the, some sort of some, some sample analogs and consistent estimates of this covariance is going to give you um, a decent estimator of half of the a variance of the additive factors plus half, a quarter of the variance, uh, dominance variance. So what does that mean? Well, it means that even assuming away all the higher order interactions from these, from these um, um, from these data alone, we couldn't uh, separately identify narrow heritability from uh, um, from full heritability, dominance variance. So, what what happens if we add half sibs? Well, we, we showed right yesterday that for half sibs uh, they don't share any dominance variance. So, um, under the assumptions, um, we we end up with a um, with, the, with this moment condition. So why is that? So what does that tell us? Why is that useful? It's useful because um, it means that in principle, adding half sibs doesn't just give us a smaller standard error. It also helps us with identification, right? If this model is of the world is correct, and we run this experiment, and we see that um, twice the half sib um, covariance is less than twice the full sip co uh, then the full sip covariance then we conclude that this v the variance of this dominance component is not zero yeah? so we learn something about it so we can identify it and that's broader point that half sibs can help with identification of these models or other kinships in general and usually the more kinships you have um, the, um, um, the, the the more credibly identified is your model now, there's one caveat to that. Sometimes what you end up with is a moment condition of the following form. So suppose we have this, but suppose that, um, that the half sib moment condition were actually quarter of VA plus one eighth of VD. Well, then what we have, right, is that this is just twice of that, yeah? Um, so it wouldn't help with separately identifying the dominance variance and the additive variance in that case, because one, one uh, restriction is just a, you know, proportional to the other, yeah? So it's not an independently informative uh, moment, you might say. Um, okay, so in that case, you might, you might be, still be that the half sibs are great because, you know, if you notice, if, you know, you have a testable restriction, you know, one should be twice the other. If it's not, then maybe there's something funny with the model you've specified, so it helps in that sense. And even if not, you know, you might have, you might, you might get a very precise estimate of, uh, um, say, the sum of these two variance components, if you want, if you were interested in that. But separately identify them is strictly not possible within such a model if all you have is those two data sets. OK, and then finally, adoptees. I mean, this is, this is exactly the same thing, but now we, we are imagining um, um, just you know, unrelated children from different households. Okay. Um, so now, uh, and of course, the difference now is that rather than assigning them to different households, we have genetically unrelated individuals who were assigned to um, the same household and reared together. Okay. So under a random assignment, then, we shouldn't expect any gene environment covariance. Um, so since gene environment covariance is probably usually positive, what that means is that we should see actually less variance right, in adoptees. So that's an important point. When people say, so when people use adoptees to identify, um, identify uh, gene environment covariance, what they're effectively doing is uh, identifying it off of differences in variances. Okay? So let's think about what could go wrong there. Suppose I go out, I gather a sample of adoptees that looks, you know, I try to make it representative. Um, I have some reason to think that the, you know, the process by which they were assigned to homes is approximately random. Um, and I measure the variance in this population of adoptees, and I find that it's, I don't know, 10% smaller than the variance in, um, among children who were reared uh, by their biological parents. Um, 
you know, one conclusion is oh, that, that you know, now I have a good estimate of gene environment covariance. But what are some, what are some things that could have gone wrong here? Like, what are some alternative explanations? You know, some things I might have screwed up in my study design. Anybody? Well, one issue, right, that, we've been, that we haven't been talking about much is the representatives of the G's and the U's, yeah? So if we see like, lower variance, it could just be that the variance of G's is lower in, my, in the sample of other P's that I drew, you know? There's something unusual about it. So, you know, molecular genetic data could in principle help there. You could try to, you could try to measure it directly. Um, and, and the issue of r range restriction again comes up. It could be that the, that the that there's a limited range of environments to which I'm allowed to assign adoptees, right? Um, and that compresses the variance mechanically, and I end up calling the, this compressed variance, um, I end up referring to it, I end up interpreting it as gene environment covariance, even though you know, it's actually something else. Does that make sense? Um, okay, and so, so, but you know, under the assumptions of all these, uh, these conditions, what we end up with if we estimate the phenotypic uh, correlation between these uh, adoptees is, a, um, is something that's interpretable about the amount of variance that you can attribute to um, environmental non-genetic factors that siblings share. Okay? And this is, a you, I'll show this later, but you can reparameterize it so that it's equal to the C squared component of ACE models for those of you who do behavior genetics. Okay, okay so I, I made... Um, I made the point that analyzing data on multiple kinships can often be a useful way to probe how robust your estimates are. Each kinship pr provides a moment condition. Ideally, you want a moment condition that's independent of the others. Yeah? So, um, going back a second. Sure. Uh, you made a few comments about how the covariance is usually positive in sign. Yes. I guess always positive in sign. Yeah. Um, are there any cases where, because of like some sort of scarce resources, that the covariance is negative in sign? So, like, one sibling has something, so the other one can't have it? I see. I don't know of any cases like that. I know of papers that have claimed, you know, I know of published papers that claim gene environment covariance is negative, but in those cases I always think there was a better interpretation that has nothing to do with gene environment covariance. Um, so remember here, we're talking about covariance with sort of mm, features of the, um, yeah, so, so I'm trying to think of any example where, the, where, where this would be true. I can't think of a plausible example where this would happen. Paige has something. Nice, yeah. Tolerate. And so if you have more advantaged parents who have more resources who are more willing to take a child Good point. like autism or prenatal cocaine exposure, yes. then you might get that negative. So you might you would get it in the in the population of adoptees, right? Yeah, yeah. It's harder to think of a set case where you get it in the population of um um in in the in the general population. Um and I will say, like, in general, the, the typical pattern you see in adoption studies is one of positive, you know, uh, um, correlation. Um, I mean, I've read, I've, I've, I've done some work on Swedish adoptees, and you, you look at the manuals from the 60s, because um, uh, 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 that's, uh, and what you see is, you know, the, the social workers are told to find a family, you know, that, that's similar to the parent. You, you're asked to kind of match on physical resemblance, because it was felt at the time. Um, that it's important that the kid, um, uh, the kid's physical appearance doesn't immediately make it obvious that this could not be the biological parents of the children. That was the thinking at the time. I don't have an opinion on whether it makes sense or not. Um, so that you know, the, this clearly matching on sort of physical characteristics, um, and I think there's also reason to suspect that there were. I mean, you see in the data that there's also positive um, matching on, on on other things that we can measure, like you know, parental education, these sorts of things. I mean. So it's not zero in practice in, in the Swedish data, though it's obviously a lot lower than what you, know, what you see. So in terms of, you can think of an adop exp adoption in practice uh, is a kind of quasi-experiment that creates a lot of independent variation in the rearing conditions of the child. Uh, but it certainly comes far short of you know, the ideal experiment, yeah. OK, so, so kin having data on multiple kinships is, is useful. Um, it allows you to probe you, the robustness, maybe you know, um, test additional restrictions of your theory that we weren't able to test. Um, and then I'm not going to talk a ton about estimation. Um, I try to sort of, I try to focus on the conceptual issues, but pretty much what every estimator is doing 
is trying to minimize some weighted distance between your empirical moments and the and the um, um, uh, and the ones predicted by your model um, for you know across the parameter space. Um, okay, so so let's just let's just illustrate this with an example. So we just went for through four cases: monozygotic twins read apart, full and half siblings read apart, and adoptees. Um, and let's imagine now that there's no gene environment covariance, so we don't have to worry about this standardization issue. I mean, adding it is, is trivial, but it's just, uh, it's just tedious, so let's not, let's not worry about it. Um, and so then we're going to have effectively three variance components. We're going to have the narrow heritability, we're going to have the dominance variance, so the sum of those is the broad heritability, and we're going to have the C squared thing, um, or the common environmental component. And then you can write the moment conditions like this if you want. You have your... Um, you have your correlations on the left-hand side. Um, you have some um, you have some matrix with, with the uh, coefficients on the on the uh, elements of the parameter vector, and then you use some procedure to figure out the values of theta, so the values of h to a, h to g, and this thing um, that minimizes the distance between your empirical moments and the and the actual moments. Okay. And you can do this in many ways. You know, these days people you don't do it exactly like this. They use individual level data, and, they, and, and this, this is a great open, um, open source software that people can use with lots of you know, annotated examples you can download from offline, and I think that's great, and if you do something like this in practice, that's what you should do. You should use one of these uh, you know, more modern softwares, but it's useful to think also, you know, to go back to the basics, I think, and just think about where the identification is coming from and what you're assuming. So, um, okay. So, now let me say something about twin studies. And I purposefully haven't mentioned twins all that much yet. <laughs> and the reason is that people sometimes when they you know, hear about behavior genetics the first time, they think there's something magical about twins. But really twins are just you know, one relation, one kinship that you can study in, 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 in with these sorts of methods. So without random assignment to environments, which is usually what we have, or that's the usual situation. That's what makes life complicated for us. Um, Genetic similarity tends to be confounded with environmental similarity. So that's what we showed in the figures. We see that people who have experienced more similar environments are more similar, but we also see that people who are more um, genetically related uh, are more similar on outcomes. And typically these things go hand in hand. So how do we really know if the MZ twins are phenotypically similar because of their genetic um, similarity or, or, and as opposed to their environmental similarity? So the basic idea here is to take advantage of the fact that the different types of twins, you know, genetically identical twins and DZ twins who are effectively full siblings born at the same time. And um, they were both, both types of twins were reared in the same family, so we can try to difference out the factors that siblings share. Um, and now the typical twin study proceeds by making a number of assumptions. Uh, the first is that the, vari the genetic variance is additive, so the genetic factor is just A of X. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So there are studies that are showing, especially for dialectic like twins, twins that are sharing male versus female co twins. Yeah. Uh, due to hormone and mostly uh, effects. Yeah. They have separate form, like sometimes they have different like, like outcomes. So, yes. Well, I mean, I'm not sure if we can safely assume it. It's, uh, the, the, um, the specific issue you're raising is, is, in principle, easy to deal with. You could just limit attention to same-sex dizygotic twins, okay? Um, but in practice, you know, there are other, uh, there are other, um, 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 <laughs> there are, you know, there are all kinds of reasons to be, you know, to be, um, uh, there are all kinds of issues that we need to think through here, um, and we'll, we'll get to them maybe when we talk about equal environments and what it means. So, so we'll, we'll get there momentarily. But, but, um, but the short answer to your question is that yes, you know, you can you can imagine that you know, M, and you can imagine that it's a problem in a comparison that's of MZ twins to opposite sex twins. That you know, if if the sex of your co-twin matters. <laughs> um, then by, de you know, then, by definition, the monozygotic twins are going to ha have more similar environments than the, than the dizygotic twins. I think that's what you're alluding to. And, you know, how important that is in practice is an empirical question. I don't know much about it, but I can imagine it mattering in some cases, yeah. Okay, so all genetic variance is additive. There's no sort of mating, at least not at the genetic level, so we get this nice coefficient from the Kemp-Thorne equations. Um, 
There's no gene environment correlation. Um, so turns out you can still get a pretty good estimate of broad heritability, even if this isn't true. But, um, but, but the, um, the other variant components kind of need to be reinterpreted at the minimum. Um, and there's the equal environment assumption. Okay. Now, the equal environment assumption is, I think, the, most, the one that's most controversial. Um, and I think it means different things to different people. So let me tell you how I think about it. I think about it in, the t in terms of the um, hypothetical experiment where you have a set of twins um, whose pre-birth conditions have been held constant or uh, similar. And then you randomly assign them to, um, to environments. So think about two uh, one set of identical twins. Um, they're both randomly assigned to different environments at birth. And then we come back 50 years later and we measure their income. Or we measure their height or whatever we want to measure. And then we look at the phenotypic resemblance between the identical twins. And we find uh, you know, that it's 0.5 or something. So under the conditions of this thought experiment, right, any resemblance that we observe has to be attributed to their shared genes. It doesn't mean, so remember, it doesn't mean that the, that the shared genes influenced your height or your income or whatever through some direct um, uh, physiological mechanism. It could be these kind of Jenksian mechanisms that we've talked about. Um, um, and so all of that stuff, to the extent that the environment, and so if you looked at these you know, twins, you know, if you looked at their income levels, you'd find some similarity. And some of that similarity surely can be attributed to the fact that they're going to be more concordant in whether they went to college or, you know, the personality characteristics and these things that we can maybe think of as environmental. But that's, I think, of as part of the genotype. So if you just observe that a set of twins, you do a twin study on income, and you find that the monozygotic twins we're more likely to be concordant in whether they went to college. That's not necessarily a violation of the equal environment assumption, the way I think about it. What would be a violation if parents of MZ twins feel, oh, because I have MZ twins, I have to treat them the same way and I have to send them both to college you know, because they're MZ. That, 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 that would be an issue. So there's a whole industry of, of um, so there's a whole industry trying to kind of, <laughs> trying to test the equal environment assumption. And um, you know, my opinion is that the, um, it's not always exactly clear what they have in mind when they say equal environment assumptions. So I've tried to, I've tried to kind of clarify how I, how I think about it. But there are other, you know, there are other views on this. Um, but this is the view that makes sense to me. Um, okay, so yeah, um, go ahead. Dizygotic twinning varies by ancestry. It's most common in West Africans. It's least common in some East Asian populations. I even heard once that the Taiwanese twin registry they had so few DZ twin births that they started enrolling regular SIBs as controls. Um, I don't know of much evidence that monozygotic, having monozygotic twins runs in the family, but might, but I just don't know. Yeah. Does that, if anybody does, feel free to speak up. Yeah. So, so usually we, we, we present these equations after re parameterization. So what we've been calling narrow heritability in the twin decomposition, what's called the ACE decomposition, we call A squared. The common environmental component we call C squared. And the unshared environment we call is basically everything else. Yeah? So those are the three variance components, so ACE. Yeah? Um, OK, and then you end up with something like this you, uh, in terms of our previous you know, machinery, the, the, the monozygotic twin correlation is H is narrow heritability plus C squared. And um, the dizygotic correlation is going to be um, half of narrow heritability plus C, C squared. Okay. And, and you, 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 you write this out, and you rearrange it, and you get that H squared A, so narrow heritability is twice the difference in the correlation. So that you've seen before, I think. So you, I think it's called Falconer's formula. Right? And it's a very um, um, uh, all, you know, if, if you're doing a twin study and all you have is data on MZ and DZ twins, effectively it boils down to this. You know, no, no matter how fancy the software you're using, ultimately this is, the, you know, this is where the identification is coming from. And it's useful to think through what, 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 what assumptions went into kind of generating that prediction. Okay. So now I want to say a little bit more about estimation. 
Um, again, I'll simplify a lot of aspects of the procedures just to highlight some, some key points. Um, and I just want, want to remind you that ultimately what we're doing is trying to make inferences about these parameters by comparing empirical moments in the data to theoretical the moments we derive from some theory and you know that you know uh, uh, well, well, how interesting that exercise is really depends on how <laughs> how much thought we put into the theory and how much data we have yeah um, it shouldn't be judged on the basis of necessarily how well you know on how good the fit is um, um, though you know um, okay so so there's a preliminary issue that you don't need to worry about too much. But in practice, when people work, rather than with correlation coefficients, they work with Z-transform. So this information is here in the slides for those who care about it. If, you, if you're not interested, please don't worry about it. The, the, main, the main reason it's convenient is that with these uh, Z-transforms, you end up with a standard error. Um, you don't need to iterate. You don't need to iterate at weighted least squares, basically, is the, is the, sh is the short answer. Okay? So let's just do an example um, of this. Um, with uh, some Swedish uh, brother correlations for BMI. So remember the data from conscription records. Um, so that's why, um, that's why it's all brothers. Okay. So, so we take, um, okay, so first we just calculate Z transforms of the original correlations. That's not very important. So, so these are effectively the, the BMI correlations for our four types of siblings. Full siblings are together. Full siblings read apart, half siblings read together, half siblings read apart. Okay? Um, and then the key thing we're going to assume is we're going to assume an ACDE model. So we're going to assume that there are four variance components. There's a narrow heritability, there's a dominance component, dominance variance, there's a shared environmental component, and there's a unique environment. Okay. Um, and so notice there's no correlation between genes and environment. There's no genetic, there's no covariance. And then effectively, what we do is we pick parameters that minimize a weighted difference between the empirical moment, or the z-transform thereof, rather, and uh, the z-transform of, uh, the, of the model prediction. Okay? So this is, a, you know, this is a not very hard for a computer to solve. Um, and you get some solution that, of course, is uh, hidden by the, <laughs> let me see if I can rearrange this. I don't know. Probably going to just ruin something. Okay, that's better. So we get some numbers. Okay, we get some numbers. The numbers are uh, additive heritability 53%, dominance 15, c squared 5%. I'm not suggesting that these numbers you should take them very seriously. I'm just this is the, these are the numbers you get when you when you when you do this exercise. Okay, um, and now. I guess I shouldn't have done that, eh? Okay, that works. So now we can, um, so we can, so, 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 so here's a better way to um, visualize the results. We had four kinships. I purposefully didn't include any twins. We're going to add them later. For each, there's a moment condition. I hope it's clear by now where these comes from. Let me just look at one of them. So half sibs rear together. Well, there are two variance components. They rear together, so the shared component, the, the, the shared environmental influences are captured by the C square thing. Um, and we, and they share some, um, some of their, there's some covariance in their AXs, right? So, and that we, we know that that's a quarter under some assumptions. Um, we, we found some, um, um, we had some, uh, pr we had some, um, uh, Z-transform correlations from the data, um, and then we had some, um, um, predicted um, analogs based on the moments that we found to fit the data the best. And what we see is that the fit here is very, very good, meaning that we were able to come up with a set of parameters that closely reproduce these features of the data. Huh? Um, okay. Now, um, that may sound impressive, and often people make it sound, you know, make it sound like that what they did, that the model fit is something really important. But we can, you know, we had seven sibling types, so we can go out and we can take the parameter estimates based on these four, and we can ask how well do they fit the data that we didn't include in our estimation, right? So how well do they predict the MZ, the DZ, and the adoptee correlation? Well, here are the predicted correlations. 
I'm going to skip the distinctions between the Z transforms and the actual correlations because they're not, it's not very important if you're far away from one. Um, and um, as you can see, there are some differences suddenly that show up, especially for monozygotic twins. Um, for monozygotic twins, we, um, um, we predict a correlation of 0.74. We, get, we got a correlation of 0.83. We underpredict the dizygotic twin um, correlation as well. And for adoptees, there's something funny going on because in the data, the, the correlation is actually negative, whereas, um, um, whereas the prediction is 5%. Now, the adop adoption sample is the only one where, where the sample size isn't enormous, so this could easily be, uh, you know, this might be a trans fluctuation, I don't know. But this is kind of, actually, all, all, all three of these, um, all th I would say all three of these deviations are, you know, non-trivial. Um, and you can, you can measure the um, deviations statistically by, by, you know, through a kind of chi-square test. Um, uh, and that's what this last column shows here. Um, so, so, so here is, um, here's the same results, but just shown in the figure. Um, remember, we used the, the full and the half sibs to fit the model. And we took the model prediction and we said, how well does it behave out of sample? Well, for adoptees, we predict the higher correlation that we find. And for twins, we underpredict. Um, and this is actually quite typical. <laughs> this is not. This is. Um, this is not um, uh, uncommon. It's not uncommon for um, um, for adoptees to be kind of outliers when you do meta analyses and, and things like this. Now, one con conventional explanation for this is just that. Well, adoptees tend to be the, the phenotype tends to be assessed when they're younger. Okay. So maybe you're comparing, and maybe the variance components are not the same when you're young and when you're old. So maybe that's what's going on. Um, and there are other explanations too that we can think about. Um, but it is a kind of, it's not an, it's not an unusual um, finding in the literature that, that, um, that the adoption um, correlations stand out a little bit uh, in, in this direction. And in fact, how, have any of you heard of Cyril Burt? Yeah. So what's Cyril Burt famous for, Alex? Uh, uh, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 please, please, please. The correlation uh, for intelligence between monozygotic twins. Yeah, so yeah. Well, he ran these experiments. Uh, he's a prominent British psychologist, but then it turned out that it wasn't clear if he really ran them all, and some people accused him of having made up data. And I never knew what to make of it. But I did ask Lyndon Eaves, the prominent behavior geneticist, once about what he thought. And I don't know, it was a private conversation, so I won't divulge his opinion. But I will tell you, I will tell you that he told me he had a letter from Bert that was written a long time ago where... Um, where Bert was confused because since you know, he was trying to fit these models and he kept finding that the models didn't fit for the adoptees and that the adoptees were much more similar phenotypically than, um, um, than, um, uh, than his you know, model predicted. So that's an interesting fact. You know, that seems to be actually a real feature of the data. <laughs> okay, so, so that's, uh, th that's the adoptees. And then for the twins, you know, one way to fix it, right, you, you, look at these, you look at these discrepancies, you can always come up with some post hoc solution, like, oh, I'm going to assume that the twins, if you just, by virtue of being a twin, you're going to share a higher fraction of your environment, the C squared. I'm going to introduce a new parameter that I call C squared subscript twin. Huh? And that's a fix, but it is a kind of post hoc, uh, you know, post hoc thing that you know, may or may not be true. And ideally, if you're going to do something like this, you, you, wanna, you want some way to discipline or test that uh, explanation. Okay, so key points. Adequate in-sample fit doesn't mean that your estimates are, have little bias or that your model is well specified. Um, and, and you shouldn't necessarily use that, those sort of criteria to determine whether or not to drop a parameter. It's almost always a, use, a good idea to include as many kinships as you can. Um, such analyses often yield insights that you'll find relevant for interpreting previous results. They can also suggest new avenues for research, like you know, the, the, the tw special twin environment thing that we just discussed. Um, and the more important thing is it gives you leverage to test and relax potentially problematic assumptions. Um, and then the one thing I added for this year's talk compared to two years ago, you should think hard about what other external information that you could use to further discipline how you formulate your model. And GWAS here comes in really, really, I mean, the, the, the new evidence that's coming out of GWAS is really proving incredibly useful here. Um, and the most obvious example, I think, comes from Alex's work, right? So thanks to Alex's work with Augie Kong and others, we now have very clear evidence that, for, at least for some traits, there's just pretty substantial gene environment covariance. Um, there just is. Uh, we don't necessarily know what 
courses gave rise to it. So I'm sure Alex has some ideas. Um, and thanks to you know, thanks to the latest iteration of our um, of our um, GWAS of education, we now know that dominance variance is not really uh, a thing. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because if you went back 20, 30 years, you'll find people who were looking at the same different research groups took that looked at more or less the same data set. It was something like the Swedish data, but it was kind of cobbled together from different countries and different periods, and it was extremely hard to know what to make of it. And so people came up with wildly different interpretations. So Sandy Jenks had been being most famously concluding that, you know, the heritability of, um, um, of um, um, intelligence or performance of cognitive tests, whatever you want to call it, uh, was 45%, which was a rude departure from the consensus at the time. <laughs> and uh, um, you know, all this debate ensued, and it never really went anywhere because you could look at the same data and you can interpret it really differently, you know, with some people emphasizing gene environment covariance, dominance, and others, um, um, you know, but and others you know, treating sort of mating differently and so on. And so you just had a lot of investigative degrees of freedom in how you approach trying to explain the data. And the reason they didn't make much progress ultimately is that you know, we just didn't have the, 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 the data to distinguish between the different um, explanations that had been offered. So everybody was able to come up with a model that fit the data. Nobody was able to say whether it fit the data for the right reason until now. I really think it's a pretty exciting time to be doing these things. OK, good. So I, I've, I'll talk for 15 minutes ab about adoption, and then you won't be hearing my voice for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to do is talk a little bit about a nice paper that I but, but by Sacerdote that, um, that uh, gathered um, a survey data on Korean-born American adoptees and their adoptive parents. Um, oh, actually, this is inaccurate. I'm sorry. He didn't get uh, data on biological children of the adoptive parents. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's a different study. I don't know where I got that from. Sorry. Um, so... Or maybe he had some information and I'm forgetting it. Okay, I, anyway. So, so remember, we talked about how adoption studies need to assume a random assignment, okay, even though it's, uh, um, you know, it, it probably doesn't hold uh, in practice. And what's nice about Sasser's data is that these whole adoptees were assigned to families using a process that's plausibly random. So families were allowed to express a preference for the sex of the child. So they were allowed to say, well, I want a girl, I want a boy. Um, but they were not allowed, but you know, conditional on that, the adoption agency uh, just picked whichever child was next in line to be uh, adopted um, and assigned that to the family. That's a claim, at least. Um, so you have an uh, assignment process that's plausibly random, conditional on the sex of the child, and that's easy to deal with because you can just control for it. And you have a relatively large sample. Oh, no, now I understand what I was saying here. Sorry, I read this to say biological uh, parents, but it says biological children. So that's correct, of course. Sorry. Now, now no. Because it's, it's often a problem in adoption studies that you don't know anything about the biological parents. And Sasserot has that problem too. But, uh, but uh, here the point is just that some of these children were assigned to families where the adoptive parents had biological children of them, their own. And of course, yeah, so he did survey those. That's correct. OK. So, so what does he do? Well, he does an AST composition based on comparing the biological sibling correlations and the uh, adoptee sibling correlations. So that I'm not going to focus on too much because it's conceptually we've talked about it a lot and you know, it does have these problems that ultimately it's a little unclear what you do with these uh, variance component estimates. The reason I like this paper is because it's a nice research design. It has some, you know, it, it comes fairly close, closer than the typical adoption study to what I've been describing as the ideal experiment. And uh, then it tries to kind of um, um, run analyses that deliver results that we can think of um, um, that, uh, that are easier to interpret. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give examples of what I mean by that. Um, so one thing he does is he estimates transmission coefficients, so intergenerational transmission, separately for biological adopted children. So in other words, how similar are you to your parents and does that similarity depend on whether there's a genetic link to your parents? And this is different for biological and adopted children. And then he does uh, some, he, then he tries to sort of estimate the effect of being assigned to a particular family. Okay. So, so the props, so you can think of the C square as maybe somewhat, so, somewhat related to this. The problem is it tells you, 
the variance explained, even under the conditions of the thought experiment, it gives you the proportion of variance explained um, by some latent factor that you don't really observe, so it's a little bit unclear what, what, what to do with this exactly. He tries to move beyond that by saying, okay, if my adoptee assignment is random, conditional on the sex of the adoptee, I can think about, um, I can think about uh, this is an experiment that treats children by assigning them to different environments. They're, that's the kind of experimental variation that you're introducing. And I can try to say something about what are the types of family characteristics um, that uh, affect the child outcomes. So as a sort of first step towards this, he, he divides the children into, or you know, the families rather, into three types. There are small families where both completed college. There are large families where neither parent completed college. And there's everything else, in effect. So he has three groups, and you know, he can, he can, he can now, um, he can estimate, um, he can estimate, you know, assuming that, assuming that the, um, the children randomly assigned, he can estimate the effects of being assigned to a family like this, as opposed to one of the other types. Um, so why is that progress, why is that interesting compared to just telling us what C squared is? Well, I think it's progress because it gets us a little bit closer to saying, learning something about what we ultimately care about, which is what are the features of the family environment that seem conducive to child development. Now, the point is not, if we find that the children in type 1 families, you know, are 30% more likely to go to college, it doesn't necessarily mean that reducing family size somehow will you know, increase college attendance or edu you know, making sure everybody goes to college uh, will um, increase family ten uh, college attendance in a future generation or something like that. But it does mean that either these things, parental college completion, or something correlated with them um, affect child outcomes. Okay? So we're getting a little bit closer to pinning down the sort of specific features of, a, of the household that, um, that predict child outcomes. Okay. Uh, here are the results from the ACE decomposition. I guess the key point here is that you know it looks at least qualitatively similar to what you see in the in the um, uh, what we saw in the more systematic uh, statically gathered Swedish data with adoptive sibling correlations generally um, smaller than the biological sibling uh, correlations. Um, yeah. Um, here are the income transmission results just shown graphically. So here the point is that we see that among non adoptees so among biological children um, reared by their biological parents, there's an income gradient. As we increase the parents' income, there's a clear tendency for, um, 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 for, the, um, for the child's um, income to go up. Okay. Um, and those sort of correlations you see a lot in, common col in pop, pop culture and, and sort of intellectual discourse. Um, if you look among other adoptees, this relationship vanishes. So at least at first, you know, you, you look at this and it's hard not to imagine that maybe the income gradient that we observe is partially confounded by genetics, right? That seems like a plausible interpretation. Um, now, is that true for everything? No, it doesn't appear to be true for education, for example. And this is, you know, so for education we see, again, with a steep gradient. If my mother went to college, I'm much more likely to have gone to college. Also, if my father went to college, there, there are some claims that that gradient is not quite as steep. Um, um, but for the, for the adoptees, again, we, now we see something that, uh, you know, that we see a much more, we see something that looks like a, you know, graded um, association. So Sassida looks at this and he concludes that probably whatever it is um, about the household environment that influences how children turn out, Mother's education or something correlated is pro with it is probably a more important factor than income per se. Yeah. Um, okay, and then the last thing is the treatment effect estimates, and then I'll stop, I think. Um, and so here, you remember, we had the three groups. Small, parent, small, small family, parents went to college. Large family, parents didn't go to college, and everybody else. So you can do all kinds. You can do compare group one to two, two to three, and one to three. And that's what he do, does in these um, analyses. And the key point really is, is just that, um, um, is ju you know, I, I wouldn't say that there is any kind of dispositive evidence here, but there is, there is some clear hints that uh, uh, being assigned to, a, um, to the high education small, uh, high education small family uh, 
has all kinds of benefits, right? So if you look in these columns, the estimates are generally in the direction that we think of as good, like more education, etc. cetera. Um, and um, also for some of the health habits, there are at least hints of things looking, um, looking better. Um, so I think this is kind of nice, uh, nice uh, important step towards learning more about the fe features of the family environment that matter. Okay. So I'll, I'll stop there, unless there are questions. Um, yeah, oh, go ahead, please. You start, you start, please. Yes. And there's no education requirement, so could it be driving the income transmission graph versus the education? Ah, interesting. Okay, so there's a good, let me repeat the question for those on Zoom. Yeah, so the question is, there's an, the claim is that there's a, an income requirement when you adopt, but not an, um, um, not an education requirement. Could that be driving the results? Um, the answer is maybe. Um, the, 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 one thing I you know, the one thing I would say is that when you look at regression coefficients, uh, the restriction range problem, you know, the restriction range problem is about variance explained, right? So, if you, so for the ACE decomposition, it's really problematic what you just described. Um, for the, um, for the and, and that's partly why, uh, why he um, chose to present the results this way. Now, what you're describing could be an issue if the effects, um, you know, maybe are highly nonlinear. So, you know, it could be. So, if we if we looked at the low income, if we include low income families, maybe we would have found a gradient there, and then we see that it's flat. But we only observe the flat portion. So that's possible. We'll never, you know, we don't know. We don't. Ha we haven't done that that um, analysis. And there were some hints when we looked at the education uh, graph that you know maybe the gradient's a little steeper here. But I wouldn't want to make too much about you know. What are probably you know was probably a very small sample ultimately. So, I think the bottom line is that the question you ask is exactly the sort of question one should ask about these sorts of studies. Did they do the best they could with their data? You know, given the um, given the inherent data limitations or their other interpretations. And in this case, um, the bottom line is I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not you know I don't think we can definitively rule out these concerns that you're raising. Um, I think there are some. I think he does a pretty good job trying to address them as best he can. That's what I would say, yeah. Uh, so I, I guess, what's the theory with the, with the graph before this one? Like, what's the theory that there's a, there's a genetic component to the transmission of income, but that there isn't here, but it applies to education? Oh. I don't know that there's a theory. It's just an observation at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just an observation. That, that seems to be going on. Like, that, 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 that's what it looks like, and uh, I wouldn't want to say that I have a sophisticated theory of this. Um, there's some sort of confounding going on with this relationship, is what it looks like to me. Yeah. As a, at minimum, we should be cautious of giving it a causal interpretation. But that's, the min that's the weakest thing I would say, yeah. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much, then. So we'll reconvene in half an hour uh, for the bio lecture. Great.